resuming our series, continuing in our series rather with 2 Corinthians. We, we picked it back up last week. Um, so this week we come to a little bit bigger of a, a chunk of scripture. And so we're not going to do what we normally do where we stand to read it because uh, it is, it's, it's a pretty hefty bite this morning. Um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 16 where we left off last week, but then we're going to be going all the way through the end of 16 into chapter 12 verse 10. It's pages 969 and 970 in the Bibles and the seats in front of you. Uh, if you want to grab those and read along, if you've got your own, I don't know what page it is. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but what we're going to do, rather than read all of it at once, is we're going to read a section, and then we're going to talk about it, then we're going to read the next section and talk about it and, and build through Scripture that way. Uh, so before we begin, if you would, please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for your birth, for your incarnation, uh, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for your ministry, your time traveling, uh, the, the, the people groups, and, and just teaching and loving and holding accountable and correcting and discipling and shepherding. Thank you for choosing the cross, uh, for, for choosing to lay down your life because that is your power and your authority and your right and taking it back up again, resurrecting, Lord, and, and conquering death. Thank you for planting the church and starting it. Thank you for filling us and empowering us and equipping us and assembling us and enabling us, God, turning our feeble efforts into something meaningful. Um, thank you for all of it. As we continue to worship you now through engaging with your word, may it be with humble hearts, may it be with open ears, May it be desiring to first and foremost praise you, to behold you, to seek you, and then to be made holier. Lord, may this be an offering to you as with everything else that we've done this morning. Get rid of me entirely. May this be all you. Get rid of us as we listen. May it be you opening our ears and teaching us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is, I was telling the worship team, this is a, a really fun section of Scripture um, because this, this is a great section of Scripture for when, and maybe adults aren't as honest about this, if you think back to your friends or your peer groups when you were in school or your kids, maybe their peer groups. I know when I was in, in middle school and high school and I was talking to my friends in the hallways about God, about the Bible, one of the things that non-Christians sometimes say about the Bible is it's just really serious all the time. It's really dry and just kind of stiff and rigid. You know, you're sitting in a hard wooden pew and it's just like somber all the time. And this is a passage of scripture that is loaded with sarcasm, which is really funny to think about. I mean, if we're being honest, it's pretty funny to think about God using sarcasm to teach his people through the pen of Paul. And we'll see that Paul really takes a very, the word I use with the worship team is just snarky. Like Paul just gets snarky with the people in this section of his letter, but he does it to draw attention to the absurd way of thinking that was plaguing them and was hampering them and dragging them down. And so we're going to start in chapter 11, verse 16. What's been going on leading up to verse 16? Because the context is important. We've said the themes of this letter are eternal identity versus temporary identity, eternal role. But one of the issues that we talked about that the Corinthian church was facing was this, this infestation of false teachers who the people had allowed to have presence in their gatherings. They allowed to have positions of influence, positions of prominence. They were learning from and being affected by these false teachers. These false teachers have plagued the Corinth church from the first letter to now. And Paul is using this second letter to them which might have been his third or fourth letter if you remember the intro, but Paul is using this to address, hey, that problem of false teachers and the influence you have allowed them to have in your lives. In the section that we just looked at last week, 11, 1 to 15, Paul really goes after these false teachers very deliberately, very aggressively, very clearly calling out the problem that they had been for the church. And so it's with that immediate context in mind that we come to verse 16. Paul says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, 
but even if you do accept me as a, even if you do accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. See, one of the problems with the false teachers is they had been patting themselves on the back and they'd been bragging about themselves in an effort to tear down Paul's ministry. So to get the people to stop listening to Paul, they'd been bragging about themselves. And so Paul's like, okay, you want to boast? Fine. That's for fools. Like it's fools who boast. So you know what? Sure, I'm going to step into the shoes of a fool. He says, even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying is boastful confidence. I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. So in the first two verses, he's like, look, this is not how God teaches. This is not how God leads people to teach. So if you hear the leaders coming to you with this arrogance, Paul's already saying, hey, what I'm about to say is as a fool who's boasting, which, quick aside, is not how God works. So he's already in the face of the teachers and the people who listen to him. And he goes on to get even more attitude. Since many bo boast according to the flesh, I too will boast, for you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. I mean, talk about getting in the face of the people. He's like, oh, these fools, these people who do not teach according to the Lord, you put up with them because you're so smart. You know so well that you gladly put up with fools. So you know what? I'm going to get on your level. I'm going to get on their page. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. Do you hear the attitude dripping off of his words? Like, do you hear the sarcasm that he is using to completely, what did he say? And before we're like, wow, Paul, that's really kind of harsh. Paul, that's not being very fair. Paul, that's not being very respectful. What did he say in 11, 1 to 15? He said he was led by God to undermine the ministry of the false teachers. So no, Paul is not being respectful of the false teachers. He's being led by God to undermine their ministry, which is distorting and abusing the gospel of Christ. And he says, hey, what those false teachers were doing to you, they were making slaves of you again. They were devouring you. They were taking advantage of you. They were putting on airs. They were striking you in your face. And then Paul says about he and his co-laborers, he says, no, we were too weak for that. Like, he is ridiculing these teachers, and he is pointing out the absurdity to the people of, you're letting people lead you and teach you and influence you who are undoing everything Jesus has done. What does it say in Scripture, in Galatians, whom Christ sets free is what is free indeed? The New Testament is littered with talking about how Jesus has set us free from legalism, from these problems that had plagued religion in that day. And these false teachers were trying to add all that back to the people. And Paul's like, you're putting up with it. Why? That's complete folly. I mean, Paul is, with no uncertain terms and no kindness, tearing down these false teachers with his attitude. And then he goes on in this. Listen to the next couple of verses, starting again in verse 21, but now going down to verse 29. He says, To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Like, he is relentless in pointing out. I mean, seriously, have you counted? We're in five verses. How many times has Paul made an emphasis of, hey, this is how fools behave? This is how foolish people act. This is how foolish people think. He is, he's not just underlining this point, he is tattooing it on the foreheads of all the people. Like, take away that this is how fools operate. So he says, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, 
in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? You ever had that friend or coworker or family member who's a one-upper? You know what I'm talking about? Or like you share something good that happened to you, and guess what? They had something even better that happened to them. You got a 5% raise at work? Oh, that's great. I got a 7% raise last year. You share something bad that happened to you, and guess what? I had something worse that happened to me. Like it's always about, oh, you did this? Well, I did even more. Oh, you suffered this? Well, I suffered even more. That, that's, does that not sound like what Paul just did? Oh, you want to boast that you're this? Well, hey, I'm even more of this. Oh, you suffered? Well, I suffered more. But what does he say? What did he say in verse 23 there? He says, I am speaking like a madman. He says, I'm literally insane to think like this. Like, this is, this is the epitome of insanity to operate in this mindset, to play this game of comparison And this is not unique to just 2 Corinthians. In Isaiah 43 and in Ecclesiastes 7, what does it say? In Isaiah 43, it says, look, don't consider the former days. Don't look backwards. Don't consider what had come before. Look at what I'm doing. God says, don't consider the former things. I'm doing something new. In Ecclesiastes 7.10, he says, Don't ask why were the former days better than the current days. It's not from wisdom that you ask that. Scripture is abundantly clear that comparing the past to today, comparing this generation to that generation, comparing this time frame to this time frame, that's folly. That's not wisdom. And then in 1 Corinthians 3, 4 to 5, his earlier letter to the same body of believers, Paul calls the church out because they're quibbling or they're quarreling over who they follow. They're comparing themselves by, well, this is the leader I was baptized by. This is the teacher I'm most associated with. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, For one one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. And then we come here to 2 Corinthians 11. And he's saying, okay, stop comparing yourself to other people. So the scripture is abundantly clear. Stop comparing this time frame to that time frame. Stop comparing this influential person to that influential person. Stop comparing this Christian to that Christian. Stop comparing yourself to that Christian, to this Christian, to that person. It's like, no, this is all folly. This is insanity. You have to be a mad person to think that you're getting any further ahead by playing the comparison game. Like you literally have to be out of your mind insane to think that this benefits you of saying, well, compared to so-and-so, well, compared to this, well, compared to that, like, no, that, that's nonsense. That is not holy in any way, shape, or form. That is not producing holiness. That is not refining you. That is not refining the church. My parents did an annoyingly fantastic job of this when we were kids. And I say fantastic because it was holy. I say annoying because it really made it hard to complain as a kid. Well, Kevin's family's going to Disney for two years in a row. Yeah, and you have classmates who have never once gone on a vacation. Stop complaining. (sighs) Do you notice we never happen to compare ourselves to the people we have it better than? Well, I don't live in that neighborhood, like those rich people. Yeah, but you know, you've got a roof over your house. Uh, if you guys know Chris Coakley down at Heartland, Chris Coakley is very heavily involved in international missions. And he's frequently in countries where food is an absolute scarcity. So if you're ever hanging out with Coakley for more than an hour, he's going to bring up a prayer of gratitude that you ate that day. Right? Like We never compare ourselves to the family who has one bowl of rice to get four of them through a whole 24-hour period. We never compare ourselves to the family who has to walk six miles just to get to work. We compare ourselves to, oh, it must be nice to have a car made in the last 10 years. It's folly. It's madness. It is insanity. And no, I'm not being mean. Those are the words Paul uses. Those are the words the Holy Spirit used through Paul's pen to say, stop comparing things. Stop comparing today to five weeks ago. 
well, it was better five. No, it's not from wisdom that you say that. God is doing something new. Well, this leader compared to that, no, that's not from wisdom that you think that way. Well, compared to her, I'm doing, no, that's not from wisdom that you operate in this mindset. I mean, 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen to 29 is just over and over again. Paul hammering a truth we see throughout Scripture. Stop comparing. Stop then boasting in that comparison. Because that's what comparison really is. Comparison is about ego. Comparison places us at the center of the universe. And so when we are operating in that mindset of this comparison lifestyle, it naturally leads to boasting. And Paul is saying, this is what's killing your teachers. This is what's killing the church. Is this egotistical, narcissistic, self-absorbed comparison game. Stop it. And then in verses 30 to 33, he introduces the flip. He introduces the switch. He introduces the, this is how we think. What's he say in verse 30? He says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Now Paul introduces the meat. He's just laid out, hey, this is folly, this is insanity, this is how mad people think, this is how mad people talk, this is how mad people operate, this is how you need to think, this is how you need to function. You need to celebrate, you need to be aware of, you need to boast in the things that are your weaknesses. This is what you need to draw attention to, this is what you need to highlight, and he goes on to explain why in these next couple chapters, in these next couple verses in chapter 12, but in this first section of this scripture, we really see Paul using sarcasm, using attitude to get in the face of a problem that has plagued the church and crippled the church in so many ways and say, you've got to flip your perspective. And before we get on our high horse and kind of chuckle at those poor Corinthian Christians, oh my goodness, I would never be part of a church that played that boasting comparison game. Really? We've never longed for the good old days? Really? We've never bemoaned, oh, they just don't make them like they used to. If only we had, if only we had people like they used to. Really? We've never said, oh, you know what, I'm not getting it all right, but man, I work with a guy who's a total blow-off. Well, our church doesn't do it all perfectly, but at least we're not them. You don't think the problems that plague the Corinthian church still don't plague the church today? And Paul says, nah, man, we've got to flip our perspective. We've got to look at our weaknesses. Why? Because that's where we are forced to rely on the sufficiency of God. And he goes on in chapter 12, and he gets into some incredible things. And we're going to look at these first 10 verses in chapter 12 in two ways, because not only does chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, not only do these verses give us a great understanding, a great proper perspective, and I keep using that word because that's one of the themes of this letter, that eternal perspective, that eternal mindset, that eternal focus, verses 1 through 10 in chapter 12 really do that. But they also lay out a very nice practical lesson on how to approach Scripture. There are two ways to approach Scripture. There's probably more, but... Whatever, we're dividing it into two for right now. You can approach Scripture and you can study it, or you can approach Scripture and you can speculate about it. One of them is healthy, one of them is helpful, one of them is not. And this, this section of chapter 12 really lays out the difference between studying and speculating really nicely. So this is 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses." Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. 
but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Do you notice how Paul goes on to tie this comparison game to conceit and arrogance? Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If you've read those verses before, if you've heard them for the first time, if you watch this later and you hear them for the first time you heard them before, are there anything in those verses that you have questions about? I know I do. When I read through and Paul says, okay, I know a man. I'm not going to boast about that man. I'm going to boast about that. Well, who's the guy? Well, that's a pretty natural. Paul spent a lot of time talking about this man who was caught up to the third heaven. Who's the man? Also, wait, third heaven? I thought there was one heaven? Now I'm really confused, Paul. And then a thorn in the flesh. What's that about? Well, we can do Bible study or we can do Bible speculation. So who's he talking about when he says, I know a man who was caught up, a man who received these revelations 14 years ago. Well, if you study Scripture, if you study Paul's life, if you look at the timeline, and if you just keep reading in the chapter... What's it say in verse 7? So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the increasing greatness of the revelations... Okay, so Paul's talking about himself. Why did he switch to third person? Don't know. But he's talking about himself. He's saying, hey, I received these great revelations, but I'm not going to boast about that. So by just simply studying Scripture, we can answer the first question. Then the second question, what is the third heaven? Verse 2. He also refers to it as paradise in verse 3. Well, again, we can study Scripture. If you go to 1 Kings 8, 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built? It's the same idea in 2 Chronicles 2. Nehemiah 9, 6, you are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve all of them and the host of heaven worships you. It's the same idea in Psalm 148. So by simply studying Scripture as a whole, taking this not as isolated pieces, but as one cohesive, coherent thought from God, we see that, okay, the idea of heaven and then a high heaven and the highest of heaven, this is something that has been used going all the way back to the Old Testament to communicate very fundamental truths about our reality. And so when the Bible refers to it as just the heavens, it says the birds of the heavens, and so when you look at the language, when you look at the culture, the Jewish people knew this. This was part of their language. This was part of their communication. And so when Scripture refers to just the heavens, it's talking about the first level of heaven, the atmosphere. So when you walk out these doors and you look up and you see clouds, congratulations, you're looking at the first heaven. And then tonight it gets dark, you look up, you see stars, you see planets. That's the high heavens. That's the, oh, ah, none of my science teachers go here. I don't remember what that word is that's above atmosphere. But that's what it's talking about when it talks about the, the high uh, stratosphere. Did somebody, stratosphere. There you go. Science. Space. I know that word. Space. <laughs> so now we've got heavens and we've got high heavens, space. And then you have the highest heavens, the heaven of heavens, what's referred to biblically as paradise. What is this? This is what we can't see. This is the realm where God dwells. This is where his presence is. Look at scripture again. Study scripture. Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So simply studying Scripture allows us to answer questions that may naturally arise as we read through Scripture. Who's the man Paul's referring to? Let me keep reading. Oh, it answers it. What's this idea of the third heaven? Let me consider Scripture as a whole. Oh, God answers it. Well, what about the other question? What's the thorn in the flesh? I have heard, we're going to look at, we're going to look at four things 
that I have heard people say the thorn is definitely this. Mutual exclusivity. Principle is very clear. If it is definitely A, it cannot be B. And yet I have heard people who I like, people who I think well of, confidently assert that, oh, well, it's definitely this. Has anyone heard, you don't have to raise your hands or anything, but has anyone heard, oh, the thorn in Paul's flesh is definitely psychological. It's definitely his internal psychological turmoil. You go back to chapter 2 and it talks about his intense grief that he felt. You go back earlier to verse 28, he talks about mental anxiety. There are other passages that talk about the grief, the despondency that he would feel about times, this anxiety that he felt for all the churches. Guys, the thorn is clearly talking about internal psychological torment. If we just apply modern understanding of psychology, we can have a better understanding of Paul. It, it's definitely internal psychological torment. Well, no, it's actually definitely his opponents who plagued him throughout his ministry. Because, see, when you understand the Bible as a whole, when you study Scripture as a whole, you realize that thorns going all the way back to the Old Testament were a very negative thing used to talk about enemies, used to talk about, like, external conflict, not internal stuff, but external problems. You go back to Numbers, you go back to Ezekiel, and thorns were used to refer to people in your life who were opposed to God, who attacked you, who made your lives harder. So it's not internal psychological stuff. The thorn in his flesh is very clearly, obviously, the external people in his life, the false teachers who are plaguing the Corinthian church. Well, no. The thorn is very clearly a physical ailment. You look at Galatians 2, you look at Galatians 6, you look at the fact that Paul used a, uh, uh, or, like he orated most of his letters in his later years. He would recite them to someone and then a scribe would write it down for him because we can speculate that Paul's eyesight was failing and that this was a problem throughout his life that he had poor eyesight. So very clearly the thorn in his flesh is not internal psychological stuff. It's not external you know, opponents and antagonists. It's, it's very clearly just a physical problem. That's what the thorn in his flesh is. Well, no, clearly the thorn is spiritual attacks. If you look at Luke 13, if you look at other places, it talks about how God would, or, or uh, Satan would afflict people with these external attacks, but they were really spiritual warfare. So that's clear. I mean, it says messengers from Satan. That's clearly what the thorn is. You know what the biblical answer is? We don't know. What's the thorn? Don't know. You can make a case for internal psychological turmoil. You can make a case for external antagonists. You can make a case for physical ailments. But we don't know. Why don't we know? Because the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say, hey, this is what the thorn is. It just says there was a thorn. And so we have to understand the difference between studying Scripture and speculating about Scripture. Now, are we overhyping this? I don't think so. Because, see, when we study Scripture, we're saying, okay, God, what are you teaching me through your word? When we speculate about Scripture, we are saying, okay, what does my perspective and my opinion understand about this? What makes the most sense to me? See, one of them allows God to be sovereign. One of them starts to elevate us to that position of sovereignty. So we have to be comfortable as believers saying, hey, I don't know. Somebody comes to you, okay, I've heard of this thing about the thorn. What is it? I don't know. I can make a case for four different things, but the Bible doesn't explicitly identify it. That's okay. There's no problem with that. And so this passage, these 10 verses, give us a really beautiful demonstration of the difference between studying and speculating about Scripture so that we can understand what God is saying. We can understand how we're called to live. But then the other reason this passage is, is a beautiful passage and the other part of it that I want to look at, because this passage also gets really nitty-gritty with some of the painful parts of life. This passage addresses or deals with the question of, why didn't God answer my prayer? I, I thought God answered prayers. I've been praying this. I've been praying this for a long time. Why didn't God answer my prayer? And what we actually mean when we ask that question is, why didn't God answer my prayer the way I want him to? 
Why didn't God answer my prayer on the timeline I want him to? Why didn't God answer my prayer in the exact manner that I preferred? I mean, let's go back to this passage. What's it say? Three times I pleaded with the Lord to remove this from me. If we operate, this is, I'm going to kind of borrow a page from Paul's book. What I'm about to say is madness. What I'm about to say is insanity. If we operate from this place of, okay, well, I've earned enough favor with the Lord to cash it in. I've earned the right to get something, right? Like Chuck E. Cheese, I earned enough tickets to go up to the counter and get my prize. Can you think of somebody who's like more deserving than Paul? Who planted more churches than Paul? Who spread the gospel to further corners than Paul? I mean, you look at how much of the early church owes its success to Paul's efforts. Surely Paul has earned enough tickets to say, hey, Lord, I'm cashing it in. Answer my prayer this way, please, right? That's madness. Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord three times to remove this. And God said, no. God didn't answer it in the way that Paul was asking him to. But God answered it. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. Consider scripture. Acts 9, 16, talking about Paul. When Saul gets blinded on the road to Damascus, he goes to the house and God appears to one of the Christians in town and he says, hey, go to this guy and talk to him. And the guy says, "Uh, no thanks, that's an enemy number one. That's the guy who's trying to kill me and my friends. God says, no, no, you need to go talk to him. You need to go share with him. You need to go tell him. And what does God say the message that he needs to go share with Paul is? Acts 9, 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Philippians 1, 29 to 30, for it has been granted to you, granted to you. Is a grant a good thing? This right has been granted to you. This, this gift has been granted to you. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. 1 Thessalonians 3, 2-4, And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, So we sent Timothy for this this specific purpose. We saw what your church was going through. We sent Timothy, one of the forefathers, one of the early fathers of the church. We sent him to you for this purpose, to exhort you and encourage you that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass and just as you know. James 1, 2-4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Answer this one internally. Don't, I'm, I'm not, we're not trying to make anybody feel bad or anything. Raise your hand internally. Who as a believer who as a follower of Christ would say, I want to be refined by God. I want to be made holier by the Lord. I want to be purified by God. I know I want want that. Right? Like my calling is to be holier. Your calling is to be holier. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. This is God's will for your life, your sanctification, your growing holiness. So Lord, I want to be made holier. I want to be refined. How does God do that? Well, what's Scripture say? Let's study Scripture. Isaiah 48.10, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Zechariah 13.8-9, And the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into Easy Street. I mean, that sounds pretty good, right? Two-thirds abandon truth, two-thirds walk away. I want to be part of the one-third, I'm part of the one, right? Like, we want to be part of that one-third that remains. 
So surely the reward for being the one-third that remains in truth, remains committed to Scripture, remains committed to Christ, remains committed to the Gospel, surely the reward for that one-third is a silk cushion. What's he say? He says, The one-third shall be left alive, and I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. 1 Peter 1, 6-7, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So no, maybe God didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted Him to. Maybe God didn't answer my prayer on the timeline I wanted Him to. But maybe it's because He's refining His church. Maybe because it's not about us. It's never been about us. What if? What if? Let's go back to those comparisons. Let's go back to those problems that were plaguing God's people throughout Scripture. Let's go back to Isaiah 43. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes 7. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 3. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 11. What if? The church is facing a harder time today than ever before. What if that's true? Maybe it's because God's refining his church. What if they don't make them like they used to anymore? What if there is a lack of godly leaders? Maybe that's because he wants some of you to step up and become those godly leaders. What if the starters are gone so that the people who have been comfortable on the bench have to finally cross the sideline and get in the game? I mean, what if we flipped our perspective and we started asking with a humble tone, okay, Lord, what are you doing in this time? What are you saying to your church right now? How are you leading us? How are you refining us? How are you growing us? How are you strengthening us? How are you making us holier? That must be the cry of our hearts. Because what do we see In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10, it's never once about us. What does he say? He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Christian who tells himself or herself that they're doing fine on their own. Yeah, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm not like desperately weak. I'm not desperately in need of Jesus to take control of every moment of my day. I'm not in desperate dependence on the Holy Spirit to lead me in every conversation. That Christian is not strong. That Christian is delusional. The moment I think, why do you, I don't want prayer to be rote. I don't want prayer to be some trivial routine that I just recite the same words over and over again, like some sort of magic incantation. There is a part of my prayer that is every day. Lord, get rid of me. Because the moment I start to think that I'm doing okay on my own, the moment I start to think, well, you know what, maybe today I'll give Jesus 90%, but I'm good with 10%. I'm doomed. The moment I lose sight of the fact that, no, I am weak apart from Christ. I can do nothing apart from Christ. I can bear no fruit apart from Christ, apart from abiding in Him, abiding in the vine, walking in step with the Spirit. The moment I start to think, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a little bit more percentage for me today. I've, I've lost it. I've missed the point. It's about our weakness, because in our weakness, God is sufficient. What does it say in Scripture? It says He chose the weak things to humble the strong. Do you remember the verse we memorized for three months? Acts 4.13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, 
and perceiving that they were what? Common, uneducated. Then they realized, oh, they've been with Jesus and they gave glory to God. That's the point. What does Scripture say? Psalm 44, 3 to 8. Romans 8, 31 to 39. Romans 8, you might be a little bit more familiar with. This is the what can separate us from the power of Christ, the love of Christ. Listen to these verses. Listen to what God says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who shall separate us from the love of God? I've had this conversation multiple, multiple times. And so I'm going to be very transparent right now, okay? Some of you may take this personally. I don't mean it personally to any one of you, but I've had this conversation with multiple people. And so, yes, some of you may think of a conversation that you and I had. We need to consider this reality, though, okay? Uh, Multiple people have expressed to me, not just in this church, not just in this state, everywhere I've lived, now that we have a daughter even more so, man, I, I would never want my kids to grow up in a time like this. I'm so glad, like, man, you must be terrified at the world your daughter's growing up in. No, I'm not. Is the world my daughter growing up in? Is God sovereign? Is Jesus resurrected on the throne? Is the Holy Spirit filling all believers, assembling his church and leading it? What in the world do I have to be afraid of? What, I mean, what? What do I have to be afraid of for my daughter? God's still sovereign. Jesus is on the throne and victorious, and the Holy Spirit is leading. What, what's different about my daughter growing up than any other period in history? What's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Just because things seem weak? Just because things, things seem deficient? No, it's never been about our sufficiency. It's been about our deficiency so that we can learn desperate dependence upon the Lord. That's the point of all of this. So that it's not about our arrogance. It's not about our self-reliance. It's not about our self-confidence. It's about submission to the sovereign God on His throne, leading His people in triumphal victory march, who are more than conquerors through Him. Tell me what you're afraid of. It's crap. It is. What else does Scripture say? Psalm 44. Listen to this. Listen to these verses, my friends. Psalm 44, starting in verse 3. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God. Ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down. Those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from your foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continuously and will give thanks to your name forever. Selah. Pause. Reflect on that. It's not about our bow. It's not about our sword. It's about our king that has never changed, that will never change. That's where we draw our strength and confidence from. Not from playing a me versus you, him versus her, them versus us. From looking at our Lord. 
That's where the sufficiency comes from. That's where the victory comes from. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-9. This is a great, great set of verses. I cannot stand this next phrase. I, like, I, I despise this next phrase. When I go into stores and I see it on plaques to hang in your kitchen, I, I apologize to the store employees. I take them down and I hide them behind other things on the shelves. God will never give you more than you can handle. Well, what's Scripture say? 2 Corinthians 1, 8-9. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. That one doesn't get crocheted into as many kitchen hangings. Welcome to our home. We were so utterly burdened we despaired of life itself. That's what God says. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. That's what Paul's getting at in 2 Corinthians 12. That's what Paul's getting at in 2 Corinthians 11. Stop boasting. Stop basing confidence in. Stop basing assurance in. Stop basing dependence upon temporary people, temporary things. It's all to make us dependent on God who raised us from the dead. The church in Corinth needed to hear it. The church in the 1700s needed to hear it. The church in the 1920s needed to hear it. The church in the 1970s needed to hear it. And the church in 2023 needed to hear it. This is who we're called to be. Weak people. Raised from death to life. By the king of life. Who fills us and empowers us. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21, verses that I love quoting to you guys. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to what? According to his power at work within us. To him be the glory. That's what it's always been about. That's what it must always be about. And the church cannot lose sight of this in our temporary roles, striving to live eternally minded lives. So as we consider these things this week, let's read Acts 26, one chapter. Let's read Acts 26, reflecting on what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. Reflecting on these lessons, reflecting on these truths. Let's read this one chapter, Acts 26. Let's continue to internalize, to meditate on, to saturate our lives with John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then reflect. Again, if you want to talk about it as a family, if you want to talk about it with your best friend, your spouse, your neighbor, your coworker, me, whoever, reflect. What's your perspective on difficulty? On hard situations? Not what you know the answer should be. Not the Sunday school answer. Not the one that'll get you the gold star in the classroom. What's your actual answer? What's your actual perspective on difficulty? And the way to figure that out is ask yourself, well, how do you respond when things get difficult? See, I can say that, well, I know, hey, my response is trust the Lord's sovereignty. I know that. When things get difficult, when our feet are put to the fire, does it turn into, well, God's not answering my prayers. Well, he's not there. Well, it, like... No, what does my actual response in life reveal about my perspective on difficulty? Am I giving lip service to trusting in God to be sufficient for all things? Or is my life actually reflecting that I am relying on his sufficiency, not my own? That I'm praising him no matter what? That my eyes are on his kingdom? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you have always been. Thank you that in our weakness, you are more than enough. That in you, we have everything we need. That the church today has everything it needs. That the church of tomorrow will have everything it needs. 
that we as your sons and daughters have everything we need in you. Make us a church that lives constantly in reliance upon you, in dependence upon you. Use us for your glory and yours alone. For victory comes from you and you alone. We praise you for this. May the way we live our lives reflect that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone, Pastor Sam here. Thanks for joining us for a Sunday sermon. If you're interested in more of the sermons from this series or some of our past sermon series that we've done, you can find them at discovercommunity.org under the sermon file. Uh, otherwise, you can subscribe to this channel to make sure you stay up to date on all our content. Thanks for joining us.